Hey, what's up? Lucas Roth here. Hey, we just bought the Selkirk Motel in Colville, Washington, Stevens County, beautiful Northeast Washington State. So I figured I'd make a video, boots on the ground, show you what's up, talk about the deal, how it went and everything else. So I'm gonna switch it, perspective. So here's my hotel room where I've been the last few days, room number 20. Um, this motel consists of two buildings, that one on the right, uh, it was built in 1970. This one was built in the 50s. And this this um, motel, the Selkirk Motel, has a total of 18 rooms. This right here um, is Main Street, Highway 395. Uh, and yeah, man, it's beautiful out here. This uh, this highway uh, connects Spokane to, um, to Canada. So we're about an hour, 15 minutes north of Spokane, approximately. So this is the main building, the original building. Here's the office. I think what we're gonna do is we're gonna pop into the office really quick. Then we'll hit the laundry room over there. Uh, check out the vacant parcel immediately north and then we'll end up back in my hotel room. So here is the office. Nice and clean, it's nice and warm in here warmed up a bit it was like 20 degrees this morning now it's closer to freezing so there you have it nothing too crazy but yeah so we've got um, so we just bought this property it was seven hundred thousand um, dollars there are nine rooms and an office and a manager's apartment in this building um, and then there on that building, there are nine rooms, five of which are, have kitchenettes. So there's a total of 18, uh, motel rooms, uh, that are rented on a, on a, you know, daily basis. The, 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 uh, the rates are the, the cheapest one is about 50 bucks, but that's only like one of those. And then like the ones with the the kitchenettes and stuff are like 130, 140. It depends on the season, of course, as well. So anyways, you know, I don't know how exciting this is for people, but this is the laundry room. Um, and then, so one of the, th the things about this deal is that uh, the property was listed uh, for, s for actually 650, 650,000 on the commercial MLS. And the commercial MLS in Washington state anyways, is, is not like a, private thing like anybody can search it but most people don't it does not feed properties to for instance like redfin and zillow and stuff like that so um anyways i'm a commercial agent i searched that stuff so i found the property there it was listed for 650 we offered 650 and we said we want the motel but we also i had looked it up and i knew that the owner also the seller also owned this parcel so i told him well well 650 and we want both he said no for both, he wanted 700,000. So he stuck to that. We agreed, put it under contract. We put it under contract in October. I guess we'll go back through here so I can lock this all up. So um, we went under contract in October of 2021. Um, and the property just closed last week, January 20th, 2022. So I'm gonna, we'll walk you through the parking line back to my unit and then we'll talk through the deal real quick. So yeah, um, in Colville, we're in Stevens County and uh, Colville is like the, the biggest town and it's like the, the capital of the county. So they got like the courthouse and a couple different things here in Colville. Really beautiful area. Lots of hiking and outdoor stuff, of course. So uh, yeah, after we bought it, I told the manager I was coming out. And she was nice enough to book me the King Suite. So I got all the curtains drawn. It's a little dark in here, but you can kind of check it out. Uh, we got like a little bar, countertop, pretty close to full size fridge. There's a little cook plate down there. Nice little bathroom, I got my little toothpaste and stuff in there. Um, 
and then got the little smart TV. So I'm gonna put this on me, talk to the deal real quick. So why did we buy a motel? Many people have asked me this. And the, uh, the short answer is that I'm most familiar with multifamily. My wife and I were looking for multifamily property and everything that was coming up was like, just not exciting, right? $2 million for eight units, you know, and it's in disrepair, you know, if you want a good asset and a good location, it's like a 4% cap rate. You know, it's like, how are you gonna make money off of uh, those kinds of numbers? And so we started drifting away, like we gotta find, we gotta increase the risk, increase the return to find something that's actually exciting to buy. And um, uh, just looking at different asset classes, we happened upon hospitality. Now we put, <clears throat> the first property we put under contract was in Lewiston, Idaho. We were searching all over Washington state, including even into Idaho and neighboring states. And we put that one under contract and went and checked it out and learned a lot from that one, right? Um, learned a lot of what we didn't want on a property. So here's here's some of the things we learned. This The purchase price of this property was 700,000, right? So finding a, a hotel under a million dollars is very rare. And there's a couple of reasons for that. One of the reasons is that when you buy a motel, um, you're buying real estate and you're also buying a business at the same time. And so what that means is that you, when you're buying some, when you're buying a motel and you, and you need to get a loan, they only care about the business. So even if you're buying this big, beautiful building, um, let's say, and, and it's got like the replacement cost of it is 2 million bucks or whatever it is. But last year it brought in $800,000 revenue and it had 800,000 of expenses. So it made no profit. As far as a bank, a lender is concerned, that property is absolutely worthless. They won't lend a penny on it essentially. So what happens is, okay, you need to, fi to find a property that you're gonna finance, which we had to, we didn't have cash to buy you know, a distressed hotel and like fix it up and stuff. We needed to get a loan. So to get a loan, you have to buy a profitable motel. And what, they, what they're gonna look at is the debt service coverage ratio. So on this particular property, we put down 25%. So on the $700,000 purchase price, we put down 175,000 and the bank loan 525. Uh, the, the terms that we got was four and a half percent fixed for five years. It's a 10 year term and it's a 20 year amortization period. So anyways, um, when the bank is determining if they're gonna write you a loan on the property, they're gonna look and they're gonna say, okay, um, you know, how much money does it make every month? And in this case, um, the, the, when we went under contract in October, the last full year and the last tax returns that we had was from 20, from 2020, right? And so in 2020, they had brought in 330,000 revenue, 220,000 were expenses, and so profit was 110,000. So, you know, profit was roughly $10,000 a month. Well, when the bank wants to know the debt service coverage ratio, they'd say, okay, well, how much profit does it make every month? That's gotta be 25% more than your mortgage payment, your fixed mortgage payment. And so this property qualified quite easily because, you know, our our uh, the terms that I described, you know, the payment comes out to like 3,500 bucks a month or something. And, um, and so, you know, that, so you'd need a profit of, of like about $5,000 every month to be able to afford the payment for the bank to write the loan. In this case, the bank could do that. That's actually really rare. Okay. It's really rare to find a motel that's under a million dollars or even under $2 million that's profitable. And the reason is that it's very hard to run a motel that's not, you know, really valuable. So here's what happened. So the, so the motel that we put under contract that's in Lewiston, Idaho, fell into this bucket of, fell into this trap that many, many, many motels fall into. And what happens is when the motel's not that profitable, right, it's not making a lot of money, then the first thing to go is the daily cleanings, right? And the keeping up of the, of the property and getting into the rooms every day and making sure that the, the guests aren't making a mess and trashing the rooms and stuff like that. Because what happens is when the property is not profitable, then they stop cleaning, right? Once they stop cleaning, then everything gets trashed. As soon as the motel is trashed, then nightly guests, you know, tourists, people who are like there on business and doing things that they're supposed to be doing, those people don't stay there anymore. Guess who does stay there? Semi-homeless people, right? People who can't, don't have any other place to go, they don't have a job, they don't have a down payment, uh, sorry, like a security deposit to get into a, 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 an apartment. You know, they're, 
they're in violent situations, things like that. Those are the people that end up renting the rooms, right? As soon as those people are in the rooms, then the property just really, really falls apart. And that's that's basically what happens. It's very rare to find a motel that's under a million bucks that's run as a motel. That the units are clean, the rooms are cleaned every night, every day. You know, like they have guests check in and check out and not stay for like weeks and months at a time. It's very, very rare. Okay, so what makes a property accomplish that, right? How can a property be run as a motel and be successful? Um, even when it's not like super valuable and super expensive and it all hinges on the manager, right? So the first, um, the first thing that we did was we were like, okay, well, if this motel is profitable, like they made a hundred, $110,000 last year in profit, that's really good. So like, why are they selling? So after, you know, some conversations and questions and things like that, it becomes apparent. Okay. What happened was the reason why the motel is run so well is because of the manager that's in place. So the superstar manager showed up a year and a half ago or whatever it was, just started knocking it out of the park, cleaned up the property, got the tweakers out, renovated the rooms, got it, got it advertised online, got the rooms filled up, was doing an awesome job. And guess what? They were just working themselves to the bone, right? This manager, she was, she's awesome, but she was work, being worked to death all, you know, she, cause she's on call all the time, right? She's cleaning the room. She's doing everything. Okay, so she told the, the, the owner, the previous owner, I'm not doing this anymore. So you can either sell it or I'm just going to leave. I'm not going to stay here. So he's like, all right, I'm going to sell it because he knows that he's not going to be able to recreate another manager like that. It's very, very rare to find somebody who can work that way and, and turn a property around and take charge of a property. So that's why the property is being sold. That makes sense. Okay, my, my next question is obviously like, well, how can I get this woman to stay? And in conversations with her, she's like, well, I, re- I actually really like living around here. You know, this is a cool place, uh, but I have to have a better balance. You know, I have to be able to take some time off. I have to be able to hire somebody that's going to help me out and clean the rooms and do a good job and, and things like that. So I was like, hey, we will definitely do that. You know, we'll we'll hire you the, the help you need, get you the resources, the help that you want so that it's a comfortable place for you to stay and continue. Because, you know, essentially without her, it's like if we don't have the manager, then we don't have a business. We're literally just buying some real estate and then we're going to have to figure everything out from scratch. That's very difficult, especially because we live six hours away in Seattle and, you know, day to day, you know, we're just not going to be able to be here. All right. So that solved like a really, really, you know, important issue for us was like, okay, we do have a management team that's willing to stay in place and keep working and keep at it. I guess the switch back to like financing and things like that. Um, so the, the 75% loan to value that we got, that's typical, right? There, in theory, you can get a 15% down SBA loan uh, because you, uh, if you're buying a motel, you are an owner operator. So you're like buying the real estate, but you're also running the business yourself. And in that case, it's, it, technically you can do 15% down SBA loans. But in reality, what's gonna happen is that the, the lenders will almost always, at least in our case, what happened, and I think is very, very common, they just like say, okay, well, yeah, maybe you can do 15% down. Maybe we'll get you an SBA loan. But then when it comes down to it, they're like, oh, yeah, no, like it's not going to work. Uh, we need 25% down on this asset. That's That's got to be your down payment. One really fun thing is that when you when you get a commercial uh, property like this, there's a couple of things that are really, really expensive. One of those is, is the appraisal. So I'm used to like doing houses in, in Seattle. We do $700,000 houses it's like popcorn. It's whatever. It's not a big deal. And the appraisals are super expensive and they want 800 to a th- sometimes a thousand dollars to do an appraisal of a house. So I'm like, okay, it's a $700,000 asset. You know, yeah, it's commercial. You have to maybe do an income valuation or something. Maybe it's a little bit more. Oh, it was way more. The, w- we went under contract in October and, um, you know, the, um, the the loan officer she calls me and she you know a few weeks into it she's like oh and a commercial appraiser won't even deliver an appraisal until the very end of december so when we wrote the contract it was a 30-day feasibility and a 60-day close so we were going to go on we went under contract october we're supposed to wrap up our feasibility november close like early mid-december she's like well they're not even going to get an appraisal back until the very end of december and it's going to cost seventy five hundred dollars for an appraisal which just blows my mind. But yeah, that's what they had. We had other bids that were even higher than that. So we took the bid that was 7,500 to do an appraisal of a 
asset. So it is what it is. Like there was no other way to get a loan without the appraisal. We had to pay $7,500 for the appraisal. Um, uh, so when, to go back to feasibility really quick, that's kind of like an important thing is like, so you write the contract and you have feasibility period, right? Feasibility is kind of like a catch all. You can check whatever you want to check. At the end of the day, you got to verify two different things. Okay. The first thing is you got to identify, you got to evaluate, check the condition of the property, the physical improvements of the property, right? So that's an inspection. We paid, uh, it was about $1,500 for an inspector to be here all day long, write up a, a big report. You know, he's up on the roof, he's in the crawl space, all kind of stuff. He found a lot of stuff, obviously, right? When you buy a commercial property that's like, you know, 70 years old or whatever, there's gonna be issues. So we had some roof things, lots of old windows, some plumbing and electrical issues. Uh, in the original building, it was built with a slab foundation that, you know, decades later they excavated underneath it so that they could access plumbing and make plumbing repairs and things like that. So all of these kinds of like, you know, oddities and, you know, uncomfortable things will pop up. But at the end of the day, you know, in the scheme of things, you just gotta make your judgment call. Like, okay, is, the, is it gonna be worth the investment? Do I have the capital behind me to buy it and then get it to an uh, estate that's going to make sense and be sustainable in the long term? And we, we decided we did. So feasibility first is physical feasibility. The second is the business feasibility, right? So again, you're not just buying real estate, but you're also buying a business. So we had to ask over and over and over for the financial information, you know? And a lot of times when you're buying a commercial property, um, it, they just don't have good records or they'll or they'll cook the books, you know, so they'll say, they'll say like, oh, yeah, well, our tax returns show a loss, but really it makes this much money that all that stuff is like super shady to me. Right. So you don't want to rely on that. In this instance, for some reason, they were really, really guarded. They didn't want to share the financial information. We had to ask over and over. But ultimately, they did give us the tax returns that showed what they were reporting and what they're paying on. That's what I go by, right? So I don't really like to hear this nonsense about like, oh yeah, it, it, uh, the tax for tax reasons we show a loss, but in reality it makes money. It's like, that's just too much. So um, so they, they, they showed the, the tax returns. We were able to look through that, get to the bottom of all that and, and it all checked out, right? It, it didn't make money at all in previous years, but then once they got this new manager in place, turned it all the way around, made it profitable. Uh, one of the things is when somebody's selling their property and it's a commercial property, they know that the value of the property is basically driven by the profitability. So they'll do every short term thing that they can do to drive profitability up, even if it's at the expense of the long term health of the asset. So, for instance, like, you know, if if, if somebody's selling their motel and the heater keeps breaking over and over, they'll just like put a band aid on it and just get it running, just get it running over and over and over instead of actually replacing it you know, and, and just, you know, extrapolate that over the, over the whole building, you know, there's going to be deferred maintenance in all likelihood. And certainly we found a bunch of things and I'm sure we'll find more now that we've actually closed it. So anyways, yeah, that's, that's the feasibility of it. That's more or less the, the, the whole story. Um, at the end of the day, like our, our plan is, um, we're going to, you know, basically hire more help, invest into the property so we're going to make the repairs that are, are required to make it like comfortable so we're not chasing you know all kinds of like issues that come up over and over so get it to a prop to a point where it's like sustainable and comfortable to run and we have enough staffing where people can like take days off and and like have a healthy approach to work and stuff like that and then you know at, at that point um we, we feel like it should be even more profitable if we make the investments into the property and then we're going to uh, possibly even build more more units onto that vacant lot that's immediately next door so right now the right now the property is 18 motel rooms and um i, I i've already talked to the the city you know planning department and they've given me like a uh pre-approval you could say of like yeah i can build another 18 rooms on the vacant lot next door so the reason why we would do that is because basically the the more rooms you have the more efficient your operation is right because if you have eight rooms or 18 rooms or 36 rooms you need a manager right you need somebody on site from the morning until the late evening and so you might as well have more units and and be able to manage them more efficiently right it's easier to staff and it's easier to run those those kinds of units so 
I'm sure I'm forgetting like a million other things that happen. Oh, one, one fun thing is um, insurance. So again, like I had this mindset of like, oh, you know, we've bought a bunch of multifamily and, and uh, single family homes and stuff like that. Insurance is never that big a deal. Well, for this property uh, to get um, insurance for one year is $11,500. So that's the expense, insurance expense for one year to, to insure the, the property. So all in all, um, we, can, we can, once we do some repairs, like switch out some electric panels and things like that, we should be able to reduce that to about 8,000, 8,500, something like that. But ultimately, yeah, that's, that's the kind of the ins and the outs. I think a 20 minute video on buying a motel is probably sufficient for now. Feel free to leave a comment or ask a question. I may or may not respond, but hey, Hope y'all do well and uh, happy 2022.